What's happening, Anarchapoco 2021? Chris Snook here. Um, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Kat. Thanks to the whole team. I am super excited to talk about the future of influencer marketing, decentralized identity, and personal agency. But before we get started, let's just cover a couple bases because I like to disclose some of my bias up front. I think it's important these days so that as you listen to this, you can try things on, but you don't immediately just accept, reject, or neglect what I talk about, but you also don't take it as gospel truth because it certainly is not. Um, several people have influenced my thinking over the last 20 years. One of those people is Rebecca Costa. So one of our quotes that I love is that we are living in a world where we are governed by our paleolithic emotions. We are governed by institutions that are medieval, but we're living amongst godlike technologies. And as we level set that, a lot of times it feels like we're running uphill, we're all excited, we're ready to tackle the world, only to get hit by a boulder of whatever regulation or whatever market shift or whatever big data breach happens to get us. And so as, as we level set today, understand that we're looking at this thing through the micro lens of what to do now, next five years, next 10 years, but also where we sit in the context of the next hundred and the last hundred. And Gerd Leonhard's a futurist. I highly recommend that you guys follow if you haven't heard of him before. He's out of Switzerland. <clears throat> and I like to always start off a lot of my talks with his recent quote, which was that in the next 20 years, humanity will experience more change than the prior 300 combined. Now, I like to analogize that as it's right now 2021, and you're all sitting here watching this in person or over a Zoom or over some kind of broadcast mechanism. And I want you to imagine that last night you went to bed and it was the year 1721. And when you went to bed, you didn't have any electricity. You didn't have any running water in your house. You probably pulled over a sheepskin rug or something like that. And in most parts of the world or the country, since it's winter, at least in the Northern hemisphere, you probably pulled a bunch of animal blankets and things like that over you, right? Because you were trying to keep warm by a fire. And then you woke up this morning and you, you went to bed knowing all of that. You blew out your candle, you went to bed. And the, this morning, a rooster or something of that ilk or the sun came through your window and woke you up. And as you woke up, you looked and this thing was buzzing next to you. And it was a, looked like a real rectangle thing with a bunch of lights on it. And it was playing some music or an alarm. And it had this thing that looked like a clock, but it was digital and, and it was buzzing at you. And you pushed a button and you finally figured out how to turn it off. And then you stepped out of your bed and you were in 400, 600 thread count sheets. And you looked out your window and there was cars and other houses and roads and gravel and freeways noise. And then there was a drone or a package delivery coming. How would you feel? And the reason why I say that is because that's what we're all dealing with today. So take however much you know about technology, society, however much you think you know about where things are, where your data is or is not, what your actual identity is or is not, how you make money and what money even is as a construct. And then pretend that that is no running water, no electricity, sheepskin rug, fireplace, 1721. And in 20 years, you will have the same amount of change as it took the last 300. And when this happens, what happens to humans because we're not that far out of the cave, is that we, we retreat to safety. We panic, we feel overwhelmed. We revert to what's called habit, right? And when we revert to habit, there's a couple things that also start to show up. Culture starts to show up. Now culture and cultural shifts are best defined simply as group habit. If, if you question this, I know a lot of you are in Mexico, a lot of you from all over the world, it's always the other person who has the accent, isn't it? It's never us. So culture is merely group habit. And when we insert ourselves into another group's habit or habits, we often feel out of place. Um, we often, maybe, maybe we get turned on, maybe we get excited by it, maybe it opens up possibility, maybe it causes us to retrench and put up our arms in defense until we're more certain of our safety. But whatever it is, culture is best defined as group habit. And I believe we are in the midst of one of the largest social cultural revolutions of the last 400 years, but certainly the most recent one since the last 50 years when we had Haight-Nashbury and the civil rights movement and everything else. 
but at this time it's at a whole different scale, right? A hundred short years ago, when we made the turn into the last century, there was 1.7, 1.6 billion people on the planet that had to make that turn. And more than, and only 5% of them lived in cities. At this present time, there's over 7.8 billion people on this planet making the turn into the next paradigms. And over 60% of them live in cities. So things that, to think about is a lot of times we, we talk about data, we get excited or we get scared, one of the others, right? But as Biggie would say, mo data, mo problems. And that's where we're at today, guys. So let's talk about data for a minute. This is 2018's number. So this is already grossly out of data. Just haven't been able to find a, a more reliable recent stat. This comes out of a Cisco study done in 2018 that looked at the amount of data exhaust that exists. And it was 400 zettabytes. Now, for those who don't know what a zettabyte is and don't feel like Googling it, it's a trillion gigabytes. So 400 trillion gigabytes is 400 zettabytes worth of data exhaust or waste. This was what came off of us walking around, going about our day with one of these in our pocket, with a laptop on our desk, with a smart thermostat in our hallway, you name it, right? Think 2018. This is how much data nothing was done with. Less than one to 2% of this was mined. And 12 short months later, we had our first trillion dollar market cap company. So imagine when data is the new oil and there's 400 zettabytes three years ago worth of data exhaust. And we all know about the big tech silos that control and own most of the data today. There's two things there. One, there's a massive amount of waste. Two, there's a massive amount of potential because this number is probably three to four X as we sit here in 2021. But there's some other macro things in, in you know, play that, that we had to you know, reconcile with, right? Travis Wright and I wrote a book called Digital Sense in 2017, and, and it was working with organizations on the one fundamental thing we believe is their differentiator, which is customer experience. And it provided frameworks for how to implement customer experience strategies and operationally across an enterprise, small, large, or in between. And the reason why we did that is because pretty much everything else today is commodity, right? Everything can be commoditized. And so the only real thing that can't be commoditized is your customer experience. And that's not just how you treat somebody on the front end or the back end. It's, it's everything in between, right? And one of the things that was driving that in 2017 when it came out was Edelman's trust survey, which showed that at that time, uh, trusting was in crisis. Well, fast forward, right? This is this year's publication, which just came out. Trust is not only in crisis, it's now bankrupt because they have declared information bankruptcy. Now, this is probably not a shock to any of you, right? Because if you still think that you're getting information and not just noise, um, then, then you're not. And again, challenge that bias. Prove me wrong. But unfortunately, as we talk about how we got here in a few minutes, what we're going to discover is that information has become noise. In the early 90s, mid 90s, when the web became public, it had all this promise of democratizing information for access to all around the world. And that, that promise still holds valid and still holds true. But unfortunately in 2001, right around when Edelman started doing these trust surveys, right? We had the dot-com burst in the bubble. And we all kind of know what happened since if we've studied any kind of just macroeconomic or, or just been in society that long. Right, we kind of moved one bubble into another bubble and into a everything bubble over that 10 to 15 year period. But what we also did was we, we went back to habit. And what was the habit? The habit was a business model we understood in the old world for a business model in this new now interconnected worldwide web world. And that was an advertising business model, heavily around CPM, and eyeballs and attention and data. And now we could do things with data we never could do before with print ads or things like that. And so it made a lot of sense and billions and trillions of dollars were generated. And in many ways that opened up and what web 2.0 opened up brought a lot of promise in new ways, right? It connected us and allowed us to communicate in ways never had before. It allowed us access to people we never had before and vice versa, them to have access direct to their customer base, to their constituent base to whomever it may be. But like all great things, marketers ruin everything. And that's kind of what's happened is the, the fundamental currencies of trust and attention that started to take root 
during this shift of the web 2.0 era as we came out of a readable web and into a read write web started to really put cracks in the foundation and where it's landed us today is even thinking people and i consider myself to be one find it very hard to think and the reason is because the algorithm feeds us more of what it thinks we want based on our behaviors faster than we can tell it no and it compounds our bias every second of every day. And they've now done studies as recent as a couple months ago where you could take somebody out of the jungle of God knows where, put one of these in their hand, get them on any social media app, doesn't matter which one it is, and within six months, radicalize them left or right. And so information has now been declared bankrupt, but we still need information, don't we? So what do we do about it? And I. I like Winston Churchill's quote, right? The further that you can look backwards, the farther you can see ahead. Uh, there's nothing new and yet every, every single decade, there seems to be some new application of something old to make something never before experienced. And so it's this weird paradox of um, copy and reinvent and copy and reinvent, repurpose, reinvent. And what COVID did, if it did anything, and we're not gonna get into the debate of COVID because I know that's a toxic subject here, but what it did was it did a couple things that have never happened before. For a period of about 60 to 90 days last year, right around this time, a couple, couple weeks from now, there was zero net migration anywhere on the planet for the first time in the 10,000 recorded years of history that we have. Nobody moved or went anywhere. That never happened before. 1.4 billion people under the age of 18 were forced into a homeschool environment, whether they wanted it or not. These, these shifts that happened became these tipping points that regardless of what post-COVID reality looks like as we emerge from it over the next months and years, certain things that got rehabitized during this last 12 to 15 months because of the pandemic will not be put back in the bag. And technologies, which we'll talk about here in a second, that have been here for a while, have had a tipping point that also likely will not go back in the bag. And industries that have been milking the cow of the last 10, 15 years of steady decline in an economy are on their final breath as they try to figure out a way to kick this can down the road a little bit more with no fundamentals behind it in a demographic statistical analysis. So literally where you're at right now is a choice, in my opinion, that you can choose to embrace, resist, fear, or get excited by. And you might have a little bit of both, but without having any delusions of grandeur, my friends, I fundamentally believe this decade, 2020 to 2030, is the most important decade that humanity has ever faced. And if any ounce of you is entrepreneurial, if any ounce of you has a humanitarian fiber in your being, if any ounce of you is ambitious, any ounce of you is empathetic, then the cement is still wet. What you have to realize, and what I remind myself every single day, is that whether I do anything or not, the cement will dry. And we will live with that cement for the next 100 years. But right now, right now, it is still wet. It can still be pushed around. It can still be imprinted. And that's our collective call to action. Not in a F the man kind of way, but in a what's possible for 9 billion people that will be on this planet over the next 10 years, 7.8 that are here right now, what's possible? What can we fix? What can we get right this time? What can Web3 bring as the executable web that Web2.0 exposed needed to be finished? And so how do you get here? How do we get here? I love one of these songs from Talking Heads when we're talking about culture, right? You may ask yourself, where does the highway lead? You may ask yourself, am I right? Am I wrong? I do this all the time. You may ask yourself, my God, what have I done? as a consumer, as a producer, as an entrepreneur, what unintended consequences have I caused or have I been party to with my dollars or my yen or my euros 
or my Bitcoin? And you may ask yourself, how did we, how did I get here? And I want you to ask yourself that, but I'll give you a little bit of a hint because this is nothing new. If you've read The Amandus, you know about the six Ds, right? But in 1999, we had our Napster moment. And for those who are too young to remember that, essentially what Napster did was it digitized things that had prior only been existing in atoms, right? So it made bits out of atoms and it made them available everywhere. And it started with music. Well, at that moment, what began to happen is an entire industry started to move towards a period of rapid dematerialization, which then led to demonetization. The dematerialization took 12 songs or 15 songs on a CD or a tape deck that sat on your Walkman or your CD player, and it put 10,000 songs in your pocket with an iPod within a few short years. It dematerialized music, it dematerialized movies, it dematerialized content. It also then demonetized the creators in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, all the way up until the 90s, the glory days of CDs, highest profit margins in the music business ever. You could make money selling the art. You could make money selling the music. You could make money selling the movie. After that and since then, you've had to use that to sell other things and you've made near zero on the money. And now for 10 euros, you can get 20 million songs curated for you off of an algorithm in your pocket with Spotify. The problem is you can't port that playlist to someone who's on iTunes. And right, so what we did with the internet in, in the 90s was we sold this promise of we're going to rip down these walled gardens. And we're going to democratize information. We're going to democratize access. But the business models came in after the dot bomb. And what happened was trust and attention became the currencies and the platforms stood up and data was mineable in ways it never had and accessible and, and, and accumulatable in ways that it had never been. And we stood up bigger walled gardens than ever. And now those walled gardens are the ones we hate, but we have fed. Well, the next window has already begun, but the next window, my friends, the great remonetization of content, of art, of community, of creation is happening right now. And it starts with decentralized ID. And we will demonetize what goes around comes around. History is cyclical. It's not a linear move. We will be demonetizing collectively and as a society and as consumers, the legacy institutions the last 50 to 100 years, the same way they demonetized music and art. And this is just kind of the way it works. And so if you wanna understand where you're going, you have to understand the scenarios, the technologies and the amplifiers. And so again, Gerd Leonhard, great chart here that he calls the end of good enough. And these scenarios look at everything from new economic paradigms, which is that purple line in the middle there. And that usually is the midpoint or the compromise between the foundational technologies that are here and that are emerging, right? Everything from blockchain to crypto to money 2.0 to smart cities to everything. And then the amplifiers, the cognitive systems and the 3D printing and the renewable energies and the, and the different things that become available. And that new economic paradigm is both generational, it's, it's economic and it's enablement oriented based on what exists during the day. And I'm going to stand on a platform and say that what I fundamentally believe, one of the order of magnitude fundamental anchors, one of the first principles of that is what are called DIDs, decentralized identities. DIDs are the thing. When every human, when every actor in a marketplace, when every product in a marketplace has a sovereign decentralized ID, it is sovereign to itself. It is immutable. It is verifiable across a network. It can participate in a market with other dids, with certainty, with less friction, with less middlemen, not removal of all middlemen. That's a misnomer. Nature doesn't work that way, guys. Centralized systems are just as valuable as decentralized systems. You just can't have them out of whack. We don't need nine suns for the, for the galaxy that we're sitting in. We need one, right? So centralized systems provide efficiency. They provide, you know, in our case, warmth, sunlight, heat, uh, an atmosphere uh, that allows us to actually exist. But at the peer-to-peer -peer level, when I get a sunburn and I get a blister, the sun's not involved in that anymore. My brain doesn't even have to be involved in that, right? Down on my sunburned area, wherever the blisters are, the cellular activity is very peer-to-peer -peer as it goes to work to try and heal that injury. And so peer-to-peer -peer at the lowest level and then up through other levels, 
creates localized efficiency. It creates localized speed, but you still rely on centralized systems and the interoperability between these two and the architectures have to be well thought out and nature always wins. So if we get it wrong, nature wipes the slate, whether it be with a fire, whether it be with earthquakes, whether it be with something else, nature will always win. Regardless of whether you think about heaven, the universe, or some other ethereal thing, the first law of existence is order. At some point, everything that is chaotic will, will form itself into an order. And that's what's happening right now. The fundamentals of everything being ripped up are starting to reorganize. But they're reorganizing around a centralized ID system that is fragmented that no longer serves us. But before we talk about DIDs, let's make this really human. Because what we also know about us is that we think in pictures. If I say your car, you either saw a screen of your mind that said, I don't own one, or you thought of the first car you owned, if you ever did own one, or if you have a car right now, you immediately saw it, whatever it was, Tesla, BMW, Ford, doesn't matter. And if I said, what color is it? Your mind sees the color, sees the actual vehicle. I say, is it clean or dirty? You can tell me, but it's, it's flashing right now as I say that. If I say your refrigerator, you see your refrigerator, wherever you are staying right now. If I say, does it open left to right? Or is it one of these guys? Is it top or bottom ice and freezer? As I say that you're going, yes, it is. No, it isn't. And you're doing that based on the picture you have in your mind as a rote response to accept or reject or say, yep, that's me, or no, that's not. We think in pictures, a picture's worth, you already said it. And so if we think in pictures, what if I say to you, what's your identity? What do you see? I guarantee you, if I asked every one of you, thousands of you on this broadcast right now, what's your identity? I'd get a thousand different answers. Some of them would be the same. Some would say their government issued identity. Others would say, oh, I'm not going to have that social enslavement number or whatever, right? Some would say, I am me, I'm, 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 whatever. Some people would say, um, well, this meat suit, this body, this is me. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Because at some point, my spirit form is going to exit this meat suit or this meat suit's going to decay. So maybe that's not me. And then you start getting real esoteric. And you think, well, wait, um, who am I when I'm at church? Who am I when I'm on the board meeting? Who am I when I'm at the soccer game? Who am I on social media, who am I on the weekends when I'm esports gaming it up? And the answer is these edge networks are all different versions of our identity and all are valid. And so the mesh governance of these different edge networks that we belong in form a whole different picture. And yet, as it relates to in America, FICO, FICO tells you that you are your social security number and the credit score. Your telephone company tells you that you are the 10 digit number that they issued you that maps to everything from your geolocation now to the pictures, to your groceries, to everything in between, because that's what you type in. But do we really need phone numbers? How many of you actually make phone calls anymore? Where do we get phone numbers from? Should that be our identity? I think the answer that you're realizing is probably not. Will it be our identity 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? Will our kids even have one? No. Just like you no longer have a phone that plugs into the wall. So these habits, these patterns, these things that we've, we cannot jerry-rig Web3 business models into Web2, Web1, and legacy 50, 100-year-old regulatory frameworks and law. But we also have to deal with what we've got to get to where we're going. And so it's, a, it's, it's building bridges across these and trying to break down these walled gardens. And the best strategy as we wrap up for business owners, for entrepreneurs, for people thinking right now, is to find the sweet spot between the technology capability, the desirability of the market, and then ultimately the viability of inserting yourself into that market with success. And so as... We part ways today. I appreciate all of your time and attention. And I wanted to give you something to think about. The six takeaways are this. Um, in digital sense, we talked about a customer experience framework, three layers, two loops that allowed you to put the customer in the center of every decision you make. Now, if you're a micropreneur, an entrepreneur, an influencer, what does that mean for you? We'll start with yourself. 
And if you can put yourself in a position where you own your identity and you start to map everything to a digital identity, including your government issued stuff and everything else, now you're sovereign to yourself. Now you're verifiable across a network in ways that require less third party interaction, which means less friction and which means orders of magnitude cost savings for those organizations that allow you to do that. And it also means speed. It does not take five days for uh, zeros and ones on one ledger to go to zeros and ones on another ledger at the bank. It takes five days to trust each other that the bank over here sending the money actually has clean funds and that it's actually got the balance and it's not going to bounce and then this fund and, then, and it's got to go through SWIFT. And then, and then by the time they've spent 90% corresponding with each other through all the correspondent banks in between, they go, yep, it's safe to settle. And then seconds, it transacts. So that happens everywhere with your health records, with, with all forms of data, right? So when, when you deal with this digital trust layer and we start to onboard people into it, we have to make it easy, not more complex. And so that's going to start with something like a portable digital ID, not one that's in another walled garden of itself where you need 15 or 20 of them, but one where it's portable. It can be applied across ecosystems and it's sovereign to you which means only you can decrypt it, only you can own your data and you get to delegate and provide consent where and when you wish. If you wanna smoke and be on Facebook, you can do it without worrying about whether the Facebook smoke you're inhaling is laced with heroin like Cambridge Analytica. Those kind of use cases. Remember that we think in pictures. As you explain this to yourself and to others, think about it in pictures. Go back to the edge, define yourself in new ways, and ultimately continue to build community. It's been a pleasure to be part of yours. I look forward to connecting with you. You can find me at chrisjsnook.com. God bless.